why birds? Uh, well, birds are outside of us and they have this huge freedom in the world. I mean, they, they're free to fly up into the air and then they are free to swim on the water and dive under the water and they're free to walk along the ground and pick at things that you didn't even know were there, you know? And so they have this interaction with, with uh, the natural world that is uh, kind of a mirror for ourselves we, we look at the birds and think, look at that bird swim, you know, mm. we, we could swim, or we, maybe we could fly. <laughs> well, there's six paintings, uh, and they're all for um, a K through 12 school in um, Grand Coulee, uh, Washington, state of Washington. So I thought that it was a beautiful school, and I thought the students were quite wonderful and I thought the teachers were terrific and it, I, I found it very inspiring. And I also found inspiring the fact that when I went up there, I had never been to the Grand Coulee Dam. I had never seen those escarpments and those exposed basalt. Uh, and I've always been interested in them because they're cubist. Yes. And I <laughs> thought, what if I put my cubist abstract painting interests together with my bird interests, which I've had, I've been fascinated with birds for a long time, but I've never actually painted them. I've never painted them with a big spatula full of paint. I do have photographs I'm looking at, but I'm also looking at real birds. So, so the swans, uh, I had, the, my original sketch had, had this one swan with a straight up neck. And then we went to look at swans and I saw one rear back like that. And I thought, ah, there it is, mm. rearing back and the back end of the swan is going down into the water. Mm. You have to get these horizontal stripes that go and the swans in front, and then they reappear, and then they reappear. But they're not the same, place to place. And then they've just got this shattering water down here that, that I love to just work and work and work and work. <laughs> not finished yet. But in this whole problem, what happens to the sky behind the swan's head, you know? And what happens in the cloud? How the cloud becomes an excuse for goofy color. Goofy, wild color. Yeah. Because we look at animals, but they're looking at us. Yes. And they, and you know, if you've ever tried to fish, you know that a fish can see you. And certainly a duck can see yes. you. Yes. So I purposely put the fish going this way and the duck going that way, and they both have bull's eyes in them, and they're both looking out at us. Mm. And that cloud is a source of light, and then that sun is a source of light. And then the fish is a source of light himself. Mm. He, Nobody told him that he should turn the switch off. You know, he's just there. <laughs> and I think that that's how you see things when you're standing looking into the water. Suddenly you see stuff like that. The fish is a source of light is a good quotation. It is, it is. The fish is a sort of, um, and there's electricity in a fish, you know? Where do we think that color comes from? And here is turns. If you take a magnifying glass, you can find in there the shapes that I was looking for. <laughs> and you've got a lot of choice. And I discovered that the Forster's turn has a, a seasonal change. In one season it has an orange beak, and in another season it has a black hat. So I took the, both the seasons together and I put the orange beak with the white head so you could see it. <laughs> and so there's certain little things I'm doing in here to make sure you can see what I'm showing you that have to do with the kinds of tricks that painters have always done. Mm. Something about this big 
slurry of yeah. complicated paint and this sort of austere accordion yeah. and these beautiful yeah. uh, crisp silhouettes together. Yeah, see, these are, these are counteracting these and this is in the middle. And, and again, it had a lot to do with Lana, who, who was on my committee, saying as a child, she used to play in these, these freshets that came down in the spring. They would come tumbling over the edge of the, of the escarpment, and they would come, and the kids would, when she was 10, 11, 12, whatever, she used to go out there and play and swim in them. And I thought, that's what they're doing. Mm. They're playing. And birds play. You can watch ravens up on the edge of, of uh, cliffs, and they're playing in the updrafts. They, all, they play. Showing off, too, maybe. Yes, that's repetition. And there's pleasure in repetition, like you were pleasure describing. Pleasure, absolutely. The pointy peaks and the owl's ears yeah. and how people connect oh, things. Oh, yes. You're clearly like... I like it. You love the dazzle of that. I like the dazzle, but I like the fact that this fans out. Mm. And, and having just recently seen a wild turkey fan himself out like some kind of card shark or something, <laughs> like that, I just love it. I just, I think birds have been decorating themselves with feathers for m millions of years. And we watch that and we say, gee, that's a good idea. that you're describing, which is uh, fairly neutral colors for the birds that you're painting, browns, blacks, whites, yeah. and how that interacts with these very bright Brighter colors. colors around yeah. them. Yeah, so, so if you have a black and white bird and you put it against a blue sky, it looks interesting, but if you put it against a blue and yellow sky, mm. it looks even more interesting, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And that's part of what's wonderful about looking at animals, is it's all a shape. They're all shapes, and they're all in motion. Have you painted animals ever before? Oh, no. This is a little <laughs> weird for me to do this. No, I haven't ever, but I know how to make curved lines yeah. and straight lines and, you know, volume. I can do it. I thought I could do it. I hoped I could do it. When you start a batch of paintings like this, you don't know exactly how you're going to do it. You don't know what's going to happen, and it takes a long time to do it. And you, you're doing something, and you think, oh, I need to change this a little bit, and this isn't quite right, and that's part of what you're doing. And it's, it's, a, it's an aesthetic judgment. It's a, it's a physical judgment that your arm makes. It's what happens when you mix paint, and you say, oh, wait. What if I put that ugly color in there with those other two colors and mix them all up and you get this electric mud? Yes, good color. But you don't, you don't know. Because it's alive. Because it's alive. <laughs> but what I really like is Van Gogh saying, painting is my home. Mm. He didn't have a home. But he's, I have a home, I'm a lucky person, but I still feel that way that painting is my home. You know? because you inhabit your paintings in a certain way. And so as you're inhabiting them, you, you have to be careful not to think too much about the committee or about the audience. You have to think about what you can do to make them as good as you can make them, as, as good as you think you should be able to make them, <laughs> whatever that means. <laughs> 